Okay. So good afternoon um, and welcome to this last class on uh, control control theory. So from next week we will have Jeremy that will uh, that will take over. And uh, today we will be discussing uh, mainly two topics: uh, planning under uncertainty and then how to do how to deal with uncertainty in LMPC. And this is going to be for the first part of the class. And then in the second part, we will uh, hopefully have an open discussions on some uh, project ideas and ongoing research projects. And finally, I prepared a two slides summary of really the key, the, key the key ideas that we saw in today's class. So let's start with the first topic, which is uh, planning under uncertainty. First of all, I wanted to um, go through the example that we saw last time. So let's say that our goal is to uh, design a controller for an airplane that has to reach a goal state. And we would like to avoid an obstacle regions where there's gonna be high wind. In this case, as the obstacle is static, we can simply design a trajectory or compute a trajectory, for instance, using the batch approach that we saw in lecture two, that goes around the obstacle and minimizes some cost. And we can do the same if the obstacle is located in a different position. So here we see that the trajectory goes uh, under the obstacle, as in this case, our cost is to minimize fuel. And so we want to take a short path to the goal. And in case, uh, so, and when we have multiple obstacles, in order to plan a trajectory that is safe, what we can do is that we, uh, that we should plan a trajectory that goes around both, uh, both obstacles. However, as we discussed next time, uh, last time, the control problem becomes challenging when we have measurements from the environment. So let's say that uh, when we start our route to the goal, we don't know which one of the two obstacles is gonna be there while we are driving to our destination, while we are flying to our destination. And so in this example, we have that there is a uh, ellipse here denoted with this black dashed line. And we know that when we enter this ellipse, we're gonna get a perfect observation about which of the two obstacles is on actually on our way to the goal. And so what we discussed last time is that in this situation, we want to plan a policy and we cannot, or we, we can, but we should not plan a trajectory. And in particular, we want to first take what it's called an information gathering action, meaning we want to drive our system uh, in a state from which we can measure uh, the state of the environment. So in this case, we simply want to enter this ellipse. And then depending on the observation, we're going to um, change the trajectory that we, that we want to follow in order to reach our destination. And here I would like to stop for a second to see if there are any questions about this example that we actually briefly discussed also last time. So now let's see why uh, we care about planning over policies. So let's say that our goal is to design a controller for a linear time invariant dynamical system. So here X is the state of the system. U is the input, for instance, the throttle that we send to the engine and W is the disturbance. So in our example, the disturbance was the, was the wind. And as we have discussed last time, um, in several applications, we actually do not have perfect access to these matrices A and B. So what we do is that we estimate a nominal model and we have some estimation errors. So the matrix A bar that we use for planning, for forecasting our trajectory in the future is different from the true matrix and the same hold for the matrix B. And given this model, which is again, uncertain, and not is not it's different from the true model of the system. Our goal is to design a control policy that maps states to actions. And what we want to make sure is that uh, state and input constraints are satisfied for all possible disturbance realizations, right? So uh, regardless of which obstacle is going to be on our way to the goal, we want to make sure that we guarantee uh, we guarantee safety. And so after. Uh, looking at the MPC approach, you and after this class, you know that computing a policy is hard. However, we can leverage the MPC approach, right? Where we solve 
a problem using the batch approach, we apply the first action um, to our system and then we replan based on our measurement, right? And we're gonna do these at all time steps. And this strategy actually can be used to solve uh, this problem because the receiving horizon strategy is a policy and uh, we can plan our trajectory to guarantee that state and input constraints are robustly satisfied. However, there is um, an issue in applying this strategy when we have uncertainty. And the big issue is that we are going to lose performance. So for instance, let's say that here our goal is again to drive the system from the starting state to the goal state, and we want to minimize uh, fuel consumption. So we want to take a short path. If we apply the receding horizon strategy, as we have discussed in the previous lectures, we are going to use the batch approach to plan an open loop trajectory that is going to avoid collision with all possible disturbance realization. So with all possible obstacles. And this trajectory is going to go around both obstacles. And what we see is that if we apply the receding horizon strategy, at some point we are going to enter this uh, ellipse and we are going to replan given the new observation about the environment. And so what's going to happen at this point is that it might not be convenient to take the, the, path, the path that goes uh, beneath the obstacle. And so as we see here, we have driven our system to a state uh, from which we cannot really exploit uh, our, new, uh, inf our new observation. So the right thing that we should have done was to plan an op um, a trajectory over policies. And so here I want to stop again for a second to see if it's clear why uh, applying the receding horizon strategy using the batch approach might lead to suboptimal behaviors. Okay. And using the receding horizon strategy uh, might also result in unsafe behaviors when we plan over open loop trajectories. And this is uh, what it's uh, called in RL, the, or, uh, the horizon dilemma. So let's say that now we have six different obstacles that we want to avoid. And let's also assume that in this example, there is some uh, small wind that is acting near, uh, near our airplane. And as there is some wind, if we apply an action U0, our trajectory is actually not exact. Uh, and our system actually will evolve in what is called a reachable set. So this reachable set of time one that here is represented by this uh, polytope represents the set of all states where we might evolve in one time step when we apply the action U0 and we have this disturbance that is acting on the system. And when we use a batch approach at time step one, we are going to apply the action U2, sorry, U1, regardless of our disturbance realization, right? So with the batch approach, we plan an open loop sequence of control actions. And so this means that this control action U1 is going to be applied for all states that belong to this ritual set at time one. And this fact implies that at time two, the set of states where we might end up is going to grow. And again, if we iterate this, uh, this procedure, what we see is that when we, when we optimize over open loop policies, the set of states where we might end up in the future might keep growing, growing, and growing, and this would result in uh, infeasibility. So this means that if we want to plan a trajectory over a very long horizon that should be robust to all possible disturbance realizations and all possible, um, and avoiding all possible obstacles, this might be infeasible. And so what this tells us is tells us that when we are planning using a long, a, a long horizon, it might be impossible to find a sequence of actions that avoids collision for uh, uncertain dynamical systems. And this thing really tells us, so this example really tells us that we need to plan using policies when we have uncertainty in our environment. So again, I wanna stop for a second to see if there are any questions about the second example. Okay, so how do, we, how do we fix this problem? Um, as I said last time, there is like a, 
huge variety of uh, great work out there. Uh, but I wanted to um, discuss about these uh, three papers uh, for two reasons. First, oh, I see there is a question in the chat. Question, is it possible given an infinite uh, horizon length? No, and the answer is, is no. Can, example, if I can predict, well, okay, okay, yeah, so let me go. So the issue here is that, um, we are planning an open loop sequence of actions. So it means that at time t equal to one, you are going to apply u1 regardless of which disturbance hit your system. So in other words, this set in blue here represents all the states where you might end up after one time step. So, and this is gonna happen when, for instance, your model is uncertain. This is something that uh, I guess we discussed when we have, for instance, model learning, we might plan to go somewhere, but in reality, we will end up uh, close by. So there's gonna be a mismatch between where we want to go and where we uh, are going to end up. And so the issue is that if now, okay, okay, okay. And, and, and actually this is again, this is called uh, the horizon dilemma in RL and there are some people that showed how to um, use uh, policies also in that, in that um, setup. So as I said, uh, today I wanted to um, show you these three papers. And as I said, there are like a lot of great works out there. Um, and I'll try to have like a list of papers on the topic. I'm gonna talk about those because those are three papers which I think had, uh, um, I've impacted my vision. So I, and I've also know those in details. So the first one is going to show us that uh, solving this problem is actually non-polynomial time. The second one is uh, an elegant approach, again, out of many that can be used uh, for planning policies. And then the third one is what most people do in practice. So this is, for instance, how we run experiments in the in the Amber Lab. And you will see you will see why because this third approach is the simplest, the most conservative, and the one that is uh, yeah. Great question: Is NP hard in which variables in the horizon length? And we're gonna we're gonna see that is NP hard in the horizon length. And so this third one is the most conservative, but the one that is computationally the cheapest. So let's start with the, with the first problem. Again, here our goal is to uh, control a linear time invariant uh, dynamical systems when W is an uncertainty. Uh, and here we're gonna assume actually this um, simplest case where W belongs to a set calligraphic W, which is compact and can be described by its vertices. And uh, our goal, again, this is a compact set that can be described by, our, by its vertices. And our goal is that um, ideally we would like to optimize over feedback policies. So our function U uh, should be a function of X subject to robust constraints on the state and inputs. And unfortunately, solving this problem is extremely hard because pi is really a function. So we would like to optimize over a set of functions, which is um, inf an infinite dimensional optimization problem. So what, uh, what was shown in this paper is actually that there is a finite dimensional reformulation. And, um, and the key idea is that we're going to optimize over a tree. And this method is really tailored to linear systems subject to uh, bounded additive uncertainty. So let's say that our goal is to robustly satisfy constraints. Then if we are uh, an initial state and we apply U0, we know that we are going to end up, uh, that basically we know that we have to be robust to the worst case event. And the worst case event is gonna be at one of the vertices of the disturbance support. And so let's say that we have only two disturbances, sorry, let's say that we have only two vertices. Then what's gonna happen is that we have to be robust to the vertex 
to the first vertex and to the second vertex. And so now if we want to have a policy, what we really want to do is that from each one of those states, we want to plan a new action. And then what we're gonna do is that we're going to iterate this strategy. And so what we really see here that the key idea um, is to plan open loop sequence. So what we can do is that we can compute these control actions, which are really a function of the disturbance that hit us at the previous time step. And so what I found really interesting about this paper is that really shows a strategy to reformulate an infinite dimension optimization problem to an optimization over a tree. And this is five dimensional. And the most important thing is that can be solved with a batch approach. Of course, uh, you know, building this tree grows exponentially with the horizon length. Uh, so this is NP hard. But the, the nice, the, the good news is that uh, when we plan, when A and B are uncertainties, you can still use exactly this approach. Of course, it's computationally intractable. So it's nice uh, to know that there is a solution, but unfortunately, computing that solution is, is hard. You have to solve for each node in this batch approach again. Yes, so actually, let me let me explain a little again. Let me go back. So here, the idea is that you write down the system dynamics and then you optimize over the entire tree. So your optimization variables are going to be u0, u10, u11, u200. So those are all optimization variables. You don't solve each node independently. Does okay. Any other questions about the um, this can approach? You, can you elaborate a little more on how you would use the same approach for uncertain A and B? Because then that oh, I guess mm -hmm. you're assuming also polytopic um, uncertainties, and then you also iterate over the extreme um, points yes. for polytopes for A and B. Yeah. Yeah, it's, like, it's exactly what you said. I should be more precise. You have to assume that A and B are polytopic. So you have, for instance, one norm or infinity norm, and then you enumerate the vertices. And the, the reason why we only take care of uh, the, the like uh, convex hull, the, the, the support point is because that dynamics is linear. If the dynamics is nonlinear, I would imagine. Yeah, totally, totally. I see. And essentially, it's like uh, we are solving a whole decision tree. Like for whatever mm -hmm. uh, extreme case you gave to me, I can always have a kind of a like W feedback policy. Is that the idea? Yeah. yeah, it's perfect. It's perfect. So basically, like if you have, I guess I should have also underlined this. When you have convex constraints, you know that the worst case is going to be at the vertices. So you only need to robustify against the vertices of your disturbance and the vertices are over the prediction horizon. So that's why you have this exponential growth. So if you're like in the middle of W, for instance, you wouldn't really mm -hmm. have an optimal policy. You would just have one that's robust. Yeah, exactly. So uh, exactly, exactly. So here the key point is that with this approach, actually you don't get back a policy, which was the thing that for me was really eye-opening is that you reformulate, you solve, and you find the optimal action at time u0. So then you need to solve this over and over to, um, to compute a control policy. So this is basically solved with a batch approach. And it's like a reformulation, but it's a reformulation that gives you the exact cost under, under some assumptions, but it doesn't really give you the policy. Uh, is that there an extension for um, time varying uh, linear dynamics? Yeah, so if it's LTV, yeah, this this actually would work out of the box. Yeah. Would it? Yeah, it would. Yeah. But it's again, it's non polynomial time. So, you know, this gets really bad really quickly. But the reason why I wanted to presented is because really this tells us actually what the optimal policy should look like. So for instance, if we solve this problem with a batch approach, basically this is gonna be a parametric program. 
So you actually know the shape of the optimal value function, which is which which is non-intuitive when you look at the problem in this in these settings. Just to clarify, uh, in the optimization program, the the policy is the same across different time steps, right? Yes, on the on okay. the left, yes, yeah, on the yes. left, yes. Yeah. Okay. Any other any other questions? Okay, but and, and so the second insight here is that really the action that we are going to apply really is a function of the disturbance that is going to hit us, right? And so this insight uh, can be leveraged to simplify the problem. And this is about this um, the second strategy. So here, the idea is that um, what we want to compute is like a, func uh, a U, which is a function of our initial state and the disturbances. And so what we saw in the previous strategy is that this is non-polynomial time, right? Because this should be a non-linear function, right? But so what was uh, proposed in this paper is like, okay, let's make this a linear function. So let's try to compute a feedback gain M that linearly maps our initial state and the disturbances to a control action. And so what they showed in this paper is that there are convex reformulations and the problem is actually uh, polynomial time. So it can be written as a convex optimization problem where the dimension of decision variables is not exponential in your prediction horizon. And the other thing which was pretty interesting is that they showed that this matrix M can be converted in a feedback gain K. So optimizing over this feedback gain M is the same of optimizing over this feedback gain K. And uh, so any, any the, questions about? Yeah, the reason why you get rid of the computational hurdle here is because you have identified some structure in writing U in terms of the disturbances. Yeah, but, but basically we know that we're gonna lose optimality, right? Because like before we had like this function and now we are forcing it to be a linear function. I see. So you are, you are inherently losing optimality. I see. And any other questions about? Um, so can you comment on now if we actually have a certain a and B matrices. Yeah, because, yeah. You know, is... Obviously, you can't know exactly what Ws are like anymore. Yeah, this is a great question. That's that's where the bad news is. The bad news is that uh, this approach is non-convex when you have A and B, and really there is not much you can do. One great paper uh, that describes like a lot of these problems is this one by Bental and Namarowski and and co-authors. And what I want to say is that there are really like great papers out there. And this is really, I want to emphasize, this is really just a short list. I'm sure I'm missing like uh, great papers out there, but there are strategies that you can use to basically over approximate the uncertainty in A and Bs. Um, but in, in, you need to basically over approximate somehow your uncertainty because the problem is in, inherited in non convex in um, it's just another mm -hmm. question yeah. when you um, write it down as a linear function are, are there any kind of like bounds on how far away it is from the optimal not that i know of not that i know of because the if you look back actually the, the beauty and like what really clicked for me about this approach is that here you can we didn't we did, I, I wanted to talk in class but I, I realized i didn't have time but basically there are some, um, some kind of problems. For instance, this batch problem that you solved in homework two, in the early 2000s, people figured out that these problems can be solved explicitly. And so we know how the optimal policy looks like. Mm -hmm. And the optimal policy in this case is piecewise affine. I see. So when you are using this, this approach, your policy is linear. Uh -huh. So in general, like you could be losing a lot, uh -huh. but you know, there might be problems where you're not losing anything. So let's say if you're very close from to the origin, mm -hmm. 
it might be that a linear policy is good enough. So if you are very close to the RG, your state and input constraints are not active. Prob without probably LQR is going to be the optimum. Mm -hmm. So this is really how much you lose is problem dependent. I see. Thank you. Uh, I have, so so uh, if we have A and B uncertainty, and mm -hmm. I'm wondering, yeah. can W support some A and B uncertainty? Because we didn't see W is state independent, right? W could be mm -hmm. state independent. Yeah, yeah, no. And here, the answer, yeah, the answer is really no. So W here is like a polygon. So it's like the. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. It's bounded, so it has to. Yeah. Be. But basically, like when I when I see that, like. What does it mean conservative? Conservative means that like when you use this approach and again, many others that are out there in literature, I think we, we need to do like one, one month course to cover all the approaches that are out there. So the idea is that you can, so the worst case, you're gonna see the worst case. So you're going to saturate your input constraints if a disturbance that is on the edge of the support is going to, is going to happen. So it means that like the worst case is actually tight. So your relaxation is actually tight. On the other hand, when you have A and B uncertain, it might be that you pick the worst case A and the worst case B, and you're still far from the, from the constraints. I see, but, but I can imagine it can support some sort of nonlinear uh, disturbance. Like for example, like yeah. W is sine or cosine X. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. But so the issue is really here. So if you have like A uncertain, basically what you will have is that if you, if you write it down, you will see that like your decision variables will multiply the uncertainty in A and B. And so that's why you get uh, no, a non-convex problem. Any other questions? And as I said, there are like really uh, many great approaches and I'll, I'll try to make my best to make a comprehensive list, but I'm sure I'm gonna miss um, some works, some works out there. So please, if you think that I'm missing something, just, just let me know. Um, so the last approach that I wanted to discuss is really, I think the, the simplest and uh, the most naive one and also the, the most conservative. But it has the great advantage that is, uh, it's, comp it's very computationally efficient. So the idea is that we can simply plan a trajectory uh, using our batch approach, using our nominal model without caring about the disturbance. But the only thing that we're going to make sure is that uh, a tube around our nominal trajectory does not intersect our, uh, our obstacles. And so once we know that, what we could do, what we should do is that we should make sure that the true system lies inside this tube. And so in general, these tubes are computed uh, using some error sets. And then what we're gonna do online is that we will make sure that the difference between the true system and the center of the tube um, is, is low. And so this is usually done using some feedback uh, tracking controller. And so the key ideas here are that the center of the tube can be planned via MPC, and then we use feedback to reduce the tracking error. So our, our control policy is gonna be the summation of two control policies, the one given by the MPC, and the second one given by the center of the, sorry, by the, for instance, at LQR, PAD, or uh, any other tracking controllers that you have for your application. And so the nice thing about this is that really the MPC plans a nominal trajectory, so it doesn't, the computational cost does not increase. Of course, the downside is that um, this approach is gonna be more conservative than the previous ones. Any questions about this uh, tube approach? Uh, I'm not super clear uh, about it because don't you in the same way have the like uncertainty of where you are 
grow over time? How does that, how does that get handled? Um, mm -hmm. Okay, that's a great question. That's a great question. And so basically here, the idea is that you always plan the center of the tube. So this means that like you don't need to reset the center of the tube to the measured state. So all you need to make sure is that you have a tracking controller that can keep you in a ball of some radius from your tracking trajectory. So let's say that like now we plan a time t0, this blue trajectory, and this is the state of our system, a time t0. We apply the first, the first input. And so what happened is that our system is gonna be somewhere around here. And now our, our MPC does not have to reset the, the center of the tube, can freely pick where the center of the tube is. So this means that at, time, at each time t, you will have an error, which is different from zero. So do you like explicitly depend on the assumption that you have like a tracking controller that's like low level for this solution? Is that? Yes, yes, yes. So oh, this sorry, error... I didn't even see that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this error set is given by this tracking controller. And of course, yes. So this is, this is the most conservative approach, but you see that basically you really decouple uh, the low level tracking and the planning. And so the computational burden associated with the MPC is exactly the same as for the, the deterministic case. Uh, so, okay, it, a few questions actually. One is when you compute this original trajectory, it seems like it can be done offline. So it's basically a planning step plus an, uh, mm -hmm. an actually like a low level controller that just track this planned trajectory, right? Is that correct so, understanding? Uh, Okay, so yes, in the sense that like you could plan this trajectory offline, but you're gonna have benefits if you replan. So if okay. you if if you replan, what's gonna happen is that the MPC controller is free to select where to place the center of the tube, as long as the true state is in the error set. Oh, I see. I see. So um... if if like a good disturbance hits you then the controller can take advantage of that. Makes sense. Um, and then, so when you plan this nominal trajectory, are you planning it without the disturbance consideration? Because if you do consider disturbance, now you run into the same problem with the minimax um, worst case explosion. Yes, exactly. And so here the idea is that you are, the thing that you need to compute offline is this error set. And so what um, you're gonna do is that you're gonna do constraint tightening uh, using this error set. Did you say we have to compute this error set? Yeah, and, this uh, error how, set. How, how would we compute such an error set? If yeah, it's, it's easy great... to elaborate. Yeah, yeah, it's, okay. So basically this error set should be a robust control invariant for the error dynamics. So in other words, if you are in this set at time t, you're gonna be, so if the error, which is the difference between the true system and the and the center of the tube is in this set at time t, at the next time t, the error is still gonna be in the same set. Oh, I see, for all disturbances. For all disturbances. Uh, so uh, for linear system is a fixed point iteration that you, you can solve, or you can use like ellipsoidal methods to do that. For nonlinear systems, the, you can still use SOS, so, but, either that or hamilton jacobi bellman reachability analysis. So if you're okay. a linear system, the answer is that it's hard. <laughs> yeah, but for, so. linear, for linear system, you can. But I think actually this is a great, I think research having in the sense like how do you compute these sets from data, right? And I think that I've seen like few works in these directions, but I think there is like really a, a lot of great questions that can be answered in this, in this area. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So uh, how do we handle the, because the main benefit of MPC is uh, handle constraints, right? In this, mm -hmm. decoupling, once we decouple MPC and the tracking controller, how do we handle state and control constraint? Ah, it's okay. actually so, the control constraint, right? Yeah, yeah, this is a great idea. So uh, this is a great question. I guess like I, 
Yes, so the state constraints, you handle them because you do a constraint tightening. And so for the input constraints, what you really need to do again, which is suboptimal, is that you're gonna split your control authority. So you're going to divide your control authority into something that can be used by the MPC and something that can be used by the low level controller. So you break the input set into two, two subsets such that the, the Minkowski sum of the two sets equals your uh, total input. And so then by definition, you know, if the, if the low level satisfies the input constraints and the mid level satisfies the input constraint, the summation of the two will satisfy the input constraints. I see, gotcha, thanks. It's actually what people are usually doing in robotics actually. Uh, yeah, this is what, for instance, this is what we are running on our, basically all of our, not all, but like a lot of our robots because it's simply computationally tractable. So these things can run like in 10 milliseconds or something on computationally constrained hardware. Is it much harder to compute this error set if you also have uh, uncertainties in A and B in addition to the disturbance uncertainty? So actually it's a great question. So for linear system, I mean, the, the algorithm is actually the same, uh, but I mean, of course you have more vertices of the disturbances. But the idea is that if you have like few vertices of the disturbance in A and B and W, so it's, it's really about the total number of vertices of the disturbances. So if you have a W which has like a thousand vertices, it's harder than if you have a W which has two vertices and A which has two vertices and a B which has two vertices. Because the reason, so how you compute these sets, which by the way, is also in the supplementary material is that you do a fixed point iteration where you propagate the uncertainty, apply the control action and keep doing so until you converge. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so now I wanted to show how actually we can do um, LMPC for uncertain systems. And so first of all, I want to uh, formulate the problem and, and highlights which are the main challenges. So here we're going to consider again, uh, linear time invariant systems, which are subject to a bounded additive uncertainty as we've done so far. And our objective is going to be to uh, robustly satisfy uh, state constraints. And we're going to consider worst case costs simply because it's actually um, easier to analyze. It's harder to compute, but it's easier to analyze. And our goal is going to be to regulate the system to a neighborhood of the origin. So now we have uncertainty in the system. We don't want to reach exactly the origin. We want to reach a neighborhood, which is uh, Matkal, uh, so which is this, this O. And so here I want to underline which, is the dif which, which are the difference with, differences with the nominal case. And the main difference is that if we are given a feasible trajectory that is able to perform the task, then the convex hull of the stored data points is actually not a safe set. It's not a control invariant because now we have uncertainty that is acting on the system. And so for this reason, we need to modify the strategy that we discussed to construct safe set and terminal cost functions. Any questions? And so now I wanted to show you with, um, with an example, how, this, how we should modify our, uh, our strategy. So here the goal again is to regulate a system to a neighborhood of the origin. So we want to drive the system from the starting position X start to our terminal set. And the goal is to design a policy which is safe and drives the system to our, our goal region. And so what we're going to do and this is going to be the main difference uh, with the um, deterministic case is that we are going to perform several rollouts associated with the same policy. So in the deterministic case, we run the task once we updated the controller, but what we need to do in the uncertain case is that we really need to collect different closed loop trajectories. And we want to do so because these cl different closed loop trajectories um, approximate the behavior of the system or the behavior of our uncertain system. 
And so let's see how this strategy can be used in, uh, in this double integrator example. So here we have again our drum problem. On this axis, we have the position. On x1, we have the position. On x2, we have the, the velocity. So what we're going to do is that we will perform a thousand uh, Monte Carlo simulations of the system. And then what we notice is that at different time steps, the data points are already clustered in different clouds, clouds of points. So what we're going to do is that we will define um, this set calligraphic X1 as the convex hull of the stored data point at a particular time step. And so the key idea is that these sets approximate all possible behavior of the systems. And of course, this is an approximation because we're not seeing uh, the entire disturbance realization. But now that we have the sets, we can start thinking of approximating the value function. Right? So what we can do is that for these data points, we can compute the, um, the cost of the rollout. So these data points in black are a Monte Carlo estimate of our cost. So here we're simply summing up the cost over the closed loop data. And so what we see is that as we have uncertainties, uh, our estimate of the cost is really noisy. So in order to denoise the estimate of the cost, for each time t, we are going to compute a, a hyperplane, which upper bounds the realized cost. And so with this strategy, we are basically denoising the data and we are approximating the worst case cost that we might encounter at each time step. And now given this approximation, we can perform the barycentric approximation so we can convexify the domain as we did in the uh, deterministic case. And so here I wanna stop for a second to see if there are any questions about why we are denoising data using these uh, hyperplanes. Uh, I was actually confused as to how you get each of the data points. Do you just sample W and then roll out the regular MPC or what does it look like? Yes, yes. So you start from the initial point and you and you run a simulation, a simulation of your closed loop system. So so what controller do you use for that? Oh, so you use like uh, a control policy that you are given. And this is going to be the policy that you update. So the assumption here is that at, at iteration zero, you have a first control policy. Oh, I see. So it's like the same, it's the same thing as before, where we, we start with like an initial thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. So it's like the yeah. slow loop around the lap. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And uh, as we discussed, you can do the same thing that you start from the origin, then you move backward. So you can get around of this first lap. Thanks. And um, yeah, so with this strategy, we basically have, I guess, one more question in the chat. Yes, so, so is the, is the, yeah, the bicentric, okay. So because our system, here we are assuming linearity of the system. So yes, because of that, you can perform all these convex uh, interpolations, but these convex interpolations are going to work if and only if actually you have uh, linear systems. When you, have, when you go towards like nonlinear or actually when you go, towards like linear time varying, these approximations need to depend on time. Any other questions about this? And so here, what we did is that we ran like a, a bunch of policy updates. And what we saw is that our cost uh, on average was decreasing again. At each policy update, we ran here, I think like uh, either 100 or 1,000 of rollouts. And so we see as our system is uncertain, we have different uh, realization of our cost, but we saw that the worst case realized cost goes down and it converges within, within some tolerance. And so finally, I wanted to um, summarize which are the differences between the deterministic and the uncertain case. 
So what we saw is that in the deterministic case, we simply run time loop where we perform our task. And then after completion, we run this iteration loop where we update our, um, our value function. On the other end, in the uncertain case, we run basically exactly the same time loop where our uh, where here we robustify against uh, against uncertainties. So in our finite time optimal control problem, we robustify. But then what we need to do is that we need to perform a bunch of rollouts and the re without changing the policy. And we need to do so because we really want to estimate the value function. So in the deterministic case. Uh, we don't get a noisy estimate, so we don't need to run rollouts. But in the uncertain case, we need to run different rollouts. And after doing so, we can run our iteration loop where we update our value function. Any questions about the, the two differences? So, um, seems like to me, uh, the, the right-hand side, we we have to do it in simulator. Have you tried like uh, implementation of the right-hand side in real-world system, like roll out for uh, stochasticity on some hardware? Yeah, it's a great point. So my my feeling is that the reason why this thing um, works on the car is because the policy doesn't change too much from one lap to the other one. So it's like performing uh, rollouts. I see, I see. Yeah, and I, I believe this is also most, also in, also in RL, you are actually have the exact same problem. When you do policy iteration, you really want to estimate the value function. But in reality, you keep updating the, the policy after each rollout. And, and, and yeah, and so also it's, um, I guess it's a common approximation, but I think it doesn't work well in all problems. I see. So, so is that a, a analogy like a on, on policy? We are doing essentially stochastic on policy uh, evaluation on on policy uh, improvement. If 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 you use RL language, because we always kind of uh, um, you know we control kind of implicitly control the trust region to make sure the change from the last loop is not that big to to to. To make sure that smooth, smooth things, something like that. Yeah, yeah, and I think there is also like a connection with the how is it called? I call the they, they call it buffer, right? So the buffer um, in RL. So in RL, basically, what they do is that they train on the last 10, 10 rollouts, right? So they have this forgetting factor, and I think it's because of this because you really want to use the data in RL. You want to use the data which are associated with your current policy. And so if the policies don't change too much, the last 10 rollouts that you have are a good approximation, basically. But it's really because of this, because you, you don't get, when you have uncertain systems, you don't get, um, you get just a noisy estimate of your value function. But I think that this is uh, something that actually I would love to try on hardware. And actually I didn't yet. I want to see if there is a difference maybe in, uh, I think there's gonna be a difference for sure in not performing rollouts and performing rollouts. So in basically like not using this loop in orange. Any other questions? And actually what you can do is that you can analyze the properties associated with, uh, with this strategy. And what you find out is that depending on which kind of policies you optimize over, you get probabilistic guarantees. And these probabilistic guarantees do depend on the number of rollouts. So you don't get you know, safety, you get a probability of being safe. And this probability really depends on like how many data points you have collected. What's interesting is again, that like if you do this, the, the simplest and really intuitive approach. So this fixed tube, the, the, the last one that we proposed where you decouple the two, actually you can have um, deterministic guarantees. So you really can prove safety. Of course, you will lose performances. It's, um, there is no free lunch. Okay, so next I wanted really to have um, more on uh, 
open discussion. Um, and I would like to uh, basically present three types of learning or like how I like to um, categorize the learn three the, the, um, the, the, the learning procedures. And these are um, this classification is borrowed by my, my PhD advisor at Berkeley. And the idea is that um, when we want to uh, design a controller for something that we have never done, or when a robot wants to do something that is new, there is this uh, uh, skill acquisition phase, which I think is the is the hardest one. So if I think about myself, when I want to, let's say, learn to play tennis, what I'm going to do is that first I'm going to read some books, maybe watch some videos, and then maybe go out and play. But this is really like unstructured. And these are problems that uh, I think these are the hardest problem, which I don't really know how to tackle. Something that we discussed uh, in this class is how do we um, how do we perform per per performance improvement? So how do we learn when we already know how to do a skill? So for instance, we already know how to race and we want to get better and better. And so one way of doing this is repetition. However, I think that something that is also very important is to analyze data. So for instance, uh, if I think about um, soccer players, for instance, they watch the match several times and they try to analyze. And so I think this is something that we don't have in the current approach, but I think at some point is going to be integrated. So let's say that we have done a trajectory that drove our system from the starting point to the origin, avoiding an obstacle. What we could do offline is to play back the data, maybe run some high level algorithm to understand if we could have done better at test time. And this is something that is going to be interfaced. And the last, uh, the last category is like uh, building muscle memory. So let's say that you have been skateboarding all your life. Uh, probably after training so much, you can uh, actually perform this without thinking. So it's basically like you offload um, the computations. And of course, like these three uh, different kinds, they, they interact among each other. But I think that these, you know, these three buckets can be used to characterize a lot of different strategies which are which are out there and again uh, here we we discuss only about a very small piece of all this only about um, performance improvements but what i wanted to um so first of all i want to see if there are like questions or thoughts on this uh, kind of um, characterization of learning Okay. I have, a, I have a question, or I guess just like a maybe one thing that I feel like is missing from this um, maybe this is something I should think about and then we can we can talk offline, but there's sort of like a, a faster adaptation that I feel like is missing from this where you know we can adapt to totally unseen um like terrain for example like we can we can walk on ice even though we didn't you know we can we can step onto sand and we don't fall over and then we can just learn or just pick up that new um set of dynamics really quickly and incorporate that and then we can also even to some extent, like step on a patch of ice and then realize that it's there. I wonder if you have any any thoughts on whether that is outside the scope of these types of learning, or do you think that that kind of quick adaptation fits into one of these? That's actually that's a great question, and it seems to me that it might be some sort of skill acquisition. And. It, it, I also feel that like the problems that you describe are the hardest. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and, and actually like Professor Borelli asked me like to work on this on skill acquisition. I think the hard part is that I don't even know how to, you know, write it down mathematically, right? Because, you know, it can be that like, yes, I can adapt and I can learn to work on sand, but like, you know, it might be that there is some terrain that like, I don't know how to work on sand, right? So now when I have to write a theorem, if I, if I know a naive example that like 
where safety cannot be guaranteed, maybe I probably cannot prove a theorem about that. So it's really hard to formulate that mathematically, I think. But it's, I mean, it's it's. I mean, it seems like a a great direction. Yeah, I think I think you're. I think that does fall under skill acquisition because, like, somebody who never grew up around snow or ice is probably not going to be able to. Is probably going to fall on their butt a lot more frequently, at least for a little amount of time, than somebody yeah. who grew up around it. it oh, sorry. I, I was just going to say that I would class these more as three phases of learning rather than. Well, I, you could also call it three, because it seems to me that it's like more like you always start out with number one if you've never done something before. <laughs> Clearly, if you're repeating something, that means you've tried it at least once before. And then once something becomes muscle memory, that means you've tried it a thousand times. So like, yeah. if you've never stepped on a patch of ice before, then that would be an easy way to put it in uh, the first category. Because like... Yeah, you're not yeah. Uh, having repeated it. Yeah, I think I think it makes I think it makes a lot of sense. And I think I, it's also how Professor Kai Borelli likes it to describe that is like you go through these phases. And, and what what I think is very hard from skill acquisition is that like at least to me it's unclear how to use failure. The failure has like a lot of information that like we are not using it right now. Yeah, it's something that we we do a lot of work to avoid in the first place in engineered systems, right? Because because uh, uh, if we can avoid it, there are a lot there are lots of costs. But maybe maybe for that reason, it it's an understudied topic of <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. Using so I think failure. Yeah, and I feel that like somehow the open of analysis should enter in here. So, you know, like, oh, something at some point went wrong and like there is this scalar that is going wrong, but it's, I think it's hard to quantify, but it's a, it's a nice, I think it's a nice topic, learning from failure for skill acquisition. Thanks. I I'll let you move on with the lecture. <laughs> yeah. So, though, I mean, this is also meant for you to be a discussion. And um, so what I wanted to discuss is a little bit this like uh, building uh, muscle memory. And so actually we, we started thinking about this problem um, because what we noticed is that in the autonomous racing example, after some point you kind of like converge, right? So, and this is actually very similar to what Jeremy uh, just said that like, you learn, you learn, you learn, and at some point you basically you stop, right? You converge, and this is all what you're gonna do. And basically, this means that our convergence, the control policy, uh, does not change, right? So you 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 kind of you you have done repetition so many times, and then the learning process has stopped. And this is actually something that is described in this book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, which I think is one of the most cited books in academia because it describes so many things. Um, that can be reinterpreted in different in different ways, but like our inspiration was that um, this book says that our brain is composed of two different entities, one that is fast and reactive and the other one that is slow and thinks. And the idea is that skills uh, go from being from slow to fast. And so we were thinking, what is the what is that we are learning? What is that it's converging after so many laps? And what we realize is that the value function doesn't change. So in this animation, again, we have a uh, two two a system which is like on two dimension. On the z axis, we have our value function. And so what we see is that after running several rollouts, our value function really doesn't change. So really, we are not we're not learning. So our control policy converges because our value function converges. And so what we were interested in is like, can we uh, leverage this value function without predicting uh, the trajectory of the system? So in other words, do we need to use an MPC controller that uses forecast once we know the value function and once we have predicted and once we have reached convergence? And the answer is, is no. So in this figure, we have here on the right, on the left, sorry, our autonomous car. The red is the planet trajectory and the green dots are the safe set. And on the right, you see the lap time that is basically converged. So our value function doesn't change anymore. 
And here we have also the average CPU time, which is around 30, 30 milliseconds. And so what I'm doing in this, in this example is that I'm shrinking the prediction horizon. So the prediction horizon gets smaller and smaller and smaller, but as our value function has converged, this does not affect our performance. So here what we see is that the performance is more or less the same, but our computational load goes down, right? And it goes down again because we are predicting over an horizon which is shorter and shorter and shorter. Until at the end, we actually uh, are using a completely model-free method that is able to drive the car around in three milliseconds. So let me show you how this model-free strategy works. As we discussed, uh, last lecture in um, this LMPC strategy, the value, so here on the x-axis we have the states and on the y-axis we have the value function. So as we had discussed in the previous lectures, the value function is computed doing this barycentric interpolation of the realized cost, right? And so what we notice is that the coefficients lambda that can be used to perform the barycentric interpolation of the cost can be used to perform the barycentric interpolation of the input. And so what we can do at test time is that we can simply solve this linear program where we don't have the model. Again, we have also only historical data. And then we're going to simply interpolate the data that we, the control actions that we have recorded. So we are just performing basically a piecewise interpolation of the stored data. And what we saw actually is that this, I'm gonna remove the audio because it's, it's annoying that this, this strategy works uh, surprisingly well. So this is a video of the car that you saw um, two lectures ago. So here we are driving the system with the, with the LMPC. And in particular here, we have already reached convergence. So the vehicle is driving at one G in the curves. And what we did is that after 33 laps, we switched to this database policy. So again, here we are simply taking the historical data, performing an interpolation of the inputs, and we are driving the car around basically at the same speed. But what we saw is that computational load well, went from 30 milliseconds to three milliseconds. And we did a bunch of experiments in different tracks. So here in blue, you see the lap time, and you see that the LMPC converges. And then at some point we switched to this data-free strategy and boom, we can drive the system basically at the same speed uh, with one tenth of the computational load. And this is also all implemented in Python. So in C++, I think we're gonna gain one order of magnitude in terms of computational speed. And so I wanted to kind of like briefly discuss why this works. So this is a playback of the data. And so here, what you saw is that these green data points are the only one that are used to interpolate the, to compute the control action. So again, this works because uh, this strategy is gonna work for linear time, linear time varying system. And here we are performing a locally linear uh, approximation. And so in this experiment, again, this is the computational time of the LMPC. And then um, after that, we switch to this model free, we go in uh, three milliseconds, we can compute the action. Any questions about this? And uh, actually a question about when do you know to switch? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, because obviously here um, offline, you can look at your graph and then see that your policy is no longer changing. And then maybe you can um, switch, but you know, maybe for more complicated task or in general, how would you decide? Um, or are you just, you know, switching at convergence? Sorry about the noise in my background. No, no actually I cannot hear it. Um, yeah, so basically what we're doing is that we're switching when I have here I had like, I think it was kind of like uh, a running average of the last five or five, I think it was probably like five or six laps. And so I see that like, if the, if the running average doesn't change, then I call it convergence. So yeah, so for instance, yeah, it's the running average of the last three, four laps. So I basically I do the mean of the last five laps, the mean of the last seven laps, the mean of the last eight laps. And if it's within a tolerance, I call it convergence. So I don't look at the policy, I look just at the cost. Okay, thank you. But it's, it's definitely like, you're right. It's definitely like an uh, heuristic. So 
if you really want to see if you reach convergence, you should check if the value function doesn't change, which, which is hard, you know. And so, yeah, as I was saying, like we tested this on also on, actually on three different tracks and we got uh, similar results. But something that you might be asking is, okay, uh, you're going model free, but still like I need to solve a convex optimization problem. Maybe I'm running this on a ECU, electronic uh, control unit on a real car. I don't have this computational power. Can, can we do better? Can we reduce the computational cost even further? And actually in the community, there are some people that have looked at this problem. And the key idea is that they wanted to leverage the fact that we actually know what is the shape of the solution of these uh, optimization problems. So these are some um, colleagues from Penn. Actually, Morari, I think it uh, was a professor here at Caltech. And their idea was to design a network that takes into account that the, that the problem that we want to solve has a particular shape. And so they, what they showed is that they designed this network and um, then online, they are going to simply apply the, the control action given by the network. So this is basically an imitation learning strategy. The only difference is that they take into account the fact that they know uh, the shape of the function that they want to approximate. And um, some, other, some other colleagues uh, went even a step further. So what they said is that, okay, we want to approximate uh, our um, optimization problem. So what we're gonna do is that offline, we're gonna train like a primal network that computes the optimal input. But on top of that, we're going to compute also a dual network, which computes basically an, an optimality certificate. And then what we're gonna do online is that we're gonna use the neural network to predict, to predict uh, the primal cost. We're gonna use the, the neural network to predict the dual cost. And then we're gonna have a simple check. We're gonna see if the solutions that our neural network predicts are feasible and our optimality gap. So the difference between, oh, here I have a typo should be, here there should be a P and here should be a D. So if the difference between the primal cost and the dual cost is bounded, then we're gonna apply our control action. And uh, I encourage you to look at the paper because actually they have really nice guarantees um, a probabilistic bounds and the assumptions are um, listed in the paper. The main one is that you don't have to, they use some uh, strategy which is called scenario approach. So this doesn't work when you have basic distribution shift. But the reason why I wanted to show you this strategy is because I think it's pretty, uh, it's pretty impressive, their results. So they were able to put this on a, on a real car uh, that was able to drive uh, on, a, on a track. And, uh, and so this is actually running on a ECU. So this is really computationally um, constrained device. So it's less computation than your phone basically. Okay, so here I would like to, this was, I guess, my, before my takeaway um, section, I wanted to see if there are any questions about these two strategies. So the, the neural networks, uh, the new, two neural networks basically learning a kind of a solver or like, a, I, I guess I'm a little confused by the output of neural network. Uh -huh. it, it, is, it, is it a solver like di directly predict the solution of uh, optimal control problem or like uh, something can verify, we can verify the optimality? So you see they do, they do both, right? So the, the green one is the solution of the optimization problem. And the red one is the, basically is the solution of the, of the dual problem. So you can use that to check optimality. And so the idea is that you do all these checks. If these checks are satisfied, then you apply your action. Otherwise, you you have you use a backup controller. I see. And uh, do they need to assume the the neural network is learning a very good, uh, like a approximate yeah. the model very good, something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so basically, like here, the application is this one that you have a controller that you cannot run on the real application. So what you want to do is that. 
again, you want to do this computationally, uh, you want basically learn as a computational reduction. So you, you could apply that controller, you could solve that uh, optimization problem if you have enough time. And so here, what you're doing is that you're collecting a bunch of training data and then you're doing basically supervised learning. And so their idea was like, let's do supervised learning both on the primal and the dual because that will give you some, that will give me some certificate when I actually deploy this on the real hardware. And yeah, I guess I have a very short summary, but they have the paper a really nice, um, really nice analysis on the error and the probability that you will uh, get a, um, how far you will be from the optimal basically. Any other questions? Okay. So finally, I have really like uh, two slides uh, because I wanted to summarize simply two bullet points uh, per, per lecture. So I hope that this will all make sense to you. And uh, hopefully this means that all the messages go through. If it doesn't, if you, if you want, you maybe can go and recheck uh, those, those lectures. So in lecture one, we really focused on Markov decision processes and we showed how to use value iteration, policy iteration. And we introduced approximate dynamic programming, which is really the engine be, uh, behind AlphaGo. And I encourage you to take a look at this summary, this slide set, which is a summary from Professor Bill Sigas that really shows how these algorithms are really at the core of uh, most of the uh, deep AI strategies. Then in lecture two, we switched gears and we started looking at problems which are where we have continuous state and action spaces. We learn how to solve the LQR problem. In particular, we computed the optimal policy. But what we saw is that for constraint system, computing a policy is hard. And so we use the batch approach to compute trajectories, right? And so this was, this lecture two was the main focus of homework one. And the reason why we focused on, on these topics is because we leveraged them in order to compute a policy using MPC. So we compute a policy for a constraint system, iteratively solving a batch approach. And what we saw in our drone problem is that this might cause constraint violation when the terminal components are not designed correctly. And so this lecture three motivated our lecture four, where we showed which are the sufficient conditions to guarantee safety and stability of MPC controllers. And we saw how to construct these quantities from data. And we, we really work with the system which are linear um, and uh, linear time varying. And then we show that when we do approximations, local approximations, those can be deployed on hardware. And we discussed at the very high level, some model learning strategies. And what we saw is that there are really a ton of strategies out there. So uh, pick the one that best fits your application. And what we saw is that there is always an accuracy computation trade-off. So if you want to have deep neural networks, it's going to be hard to solve a optimization problem. At least it's going to be harder than having linear models, right? So there is always this computation trade-off that we need to take, take into account. And the last topic that we discussed in today's lecture was uh, how to plan when we have uh, uncertain systems. And also we saw how to estimate value function by denoising data. And so this was, uh, I guess, a very short summary of these past six lectures. And so I hope that you, that you enjoyed. And I think I'll stay online if you have any questions about today or the previous lectures. Uh, thanks for the lectures, Hugo. I have a very, very high level question, which I'm thinking about for, for a long time. Like, since learning past control is more and more popular, um, I'm wondering how do you think about, so do we need to benchmark um, some things like people already did in learning community? Because like, cause, you know, because so, there are like, so many different frameworks, so many different methods. So how do we compare with each other? So do you think we need a, some sort of benchmark? Uh, you know, to kind of do these comparisons. Okay, so 
Okay, the first thing that comes to mind is that, so for the IQR problem, actually people complete the regret, which I think that that's, that's, that's good enough, right? Because for the LQR problem, uh, you know that the optimal policy is like KX. So I think if you compute the regret, you can really like compare different approaches just by looking at the regret. With that being said, I've seen like few papers where you have like no linear control and you start to compute regret. So in that case, I'm not sure uh, with respect, regret with respect to what. So I think because, you know, it cannot be with respect to the optimal controller because we saw today that the optimal controller is not polynomial time already for the linear system when you have constraints. So I think that absolutely yes. So when we go, I think for, for linear case, I think it's fine to just compute regret. I think when you start adding constraints, probably having benchmarks would be um, a great idea. But it's an, an, another thing that I, I mean, I, I know most people here probably already do that, but I strongly believe in open source code. Uh, I think well commented open source code, it's hard. I think I'm not, uh, I'm not doing it very well, but like open source, uh, for instance, something that I try to do every time that I publish a paper. So I think already that would be really nice in the community. So it happened kind of like a few times that like I wanted to see how an algorithm performed and I was not able to find the code open source. So I think that that's the first step. And the second step for sure benchmarks. Yes, thanks, I totally agree. Uh, I, have an, uh, I have a question as well. So um, thanks for the lectures, I really enjoyed them. Uh, Thank you. Uh, my question was how does uh, kind of, it's that you brought up regret, uh, how does regret kind of fall into the, um, like, cause you could, I think there's people that study like, you know, this disturbance process in regret frameworks. And we didn't really talk about that in your literature survey. Mm -hmm. So if you could kind yeah. of just. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, again, as I said, there is like a lot of great work out there. In the past like two years, as I show like around 10,000 papers. So I was also a little bit scared about uh, uh, talking about it because of course I was, going to leave something off. So this is like the premise, I guess. So I think about regret, as I said, I think that like for linear systems is exactly the right thing to do. And uh, you know, some people like for instance, Ben Rack, they, they, have, they have really, they, they, are, they, they are really advocate about it. And I completely agree, right? That basically if you have two algorithms, you have a linear system and you compute the regret, then you can easily compute two algorithms, compare two algorithms, right? Because you are, in both cases, your regret is gonna be with respect to the optimal controller. So you are comparing basically two things against the best thing. And so then this can tell you something about the two approaches. I think that the story changes when you add already constraints, when you add constraints or like when your true controller is nonlinear. Because in that case, for instance, in the nonlinear case, I've seen some people that have, you know, deep neural network and all these very complicated things. But basically you are comparing regret versus your controller that knows the model exactly. And then, you know, I can compute a controller that knows the model, not uh, as well as your controller, but is going to perform better simply because, um, you know, my controller design is better. So for instance, you may be optimizing over open loop sequences and then, you know, I'm optimizing over closed loop sequences. So probably also if I have a, a worse model, I'm gonna perform better. So I think that regret is the right thing to do and a great thing to analyze when you are comparing against the optimal. So when you're not comparing against the optimal, I don't, I don't see value, but I can be wrong. Uh, and I have a second question, which is in the first paper you showed us the mini max tree mm -hmm. thing. Um, I think it, the conclusion it sounded like was because of this paper, we know it's NP hard in the horizon, but isn't it more like that solution to that, like their proposed, like, does it show that the That's all solutions point. are like, you know, like they just their algorithm is NP hard, right? It's not like anyone who comes up with anything to solve yeah, this yeah. Hard, right yeah yeah i guess i didn't explain that very well but like the fact is this one that like you have a convex set of constraints and you want to satisfy this for all disturbance realizations so for all usually it's a max right so you can have either the for all or you can have the max instead of the for all 
And so now you want to maximize something which is convex. So you know that the worst case is gonna be at the boundary. So now is the worst case is at the boundary of the disturbance along the horizon. So if you, can, if you consider like all possible disturbance that can hit you, you will have to consider the worst case along the horizon, which is exponential. Right, because let's say you have like two time steps and you have uh, two vertices of the disturbances. You're gonna have two to the power uh, of two, right? And then this is for three steps, you're gonna be like uh, two to the power of three and so on and so forth. So your worst case is gonna be the worst case sequence. And, and so you need to robustify for all of this because you don't know a priori which one is it the worst right, one. Right, right. I understand, I understand that's their reformulation. But for instance, if you took any other mm -hmm. solution to the robust, like, you know, planning problem, like mm -hmm. there are solutions out there that aren't NP hard, right? Yeah. So, so I, I, that's kind of just what I was asking. Um, yeah. So basically, okay. So what, so what they're showing is that a feedback policy basically means that like for all disturbances, you should have a different action. So now for all disturbances, a different action, this is an infinite horizon optimization problem. Sorry, an infinite dimensional optimization problem, right? Because for all possible realizations, you should have an input sequence. And now what they're saying is that what you need to do is that you need to consider only the vertices. So this is like, tight. I, I agree with you that like, if you relax that assumption and you don't consider the a policy, which is like, you know, a function, like a, if you put structure on your feedback, then you will get something tractable. And this is for instance, what several people have right. done in, in the community. Okay. Thanks for making that distinction. That yeah. makes sense. Um, I have a, a very silly question about um, robust MPC. So um, if you look at the formulation, like let's just say LQR, right? And then you have um, disturbance W that belongs to your set. Um, so, so it makes sense when your disturbance are, you know, from a distribution. So then your uh, objective function is taken, you know, in expectation with respect to the, the distribution of the disturbance. But if your disturbance are say like deterministic and they're just taken from a set, how how does objective function work since you don't know disturbance of beforehand? Does my question make sense? Okay, uh, kind of. So one thing is that like your you usually have a support, but on top of that you have a distribution. So usually you say like my disturbance is, is like a truncated Gaussian with this support. So you have some. Probably so you, you always assume a kind of distribution on your disturbance. So then your objective function is almost always taken um, in expectation. Okay, so actually it's, it's a little, it's, it's surprising because expectation is actually harder to solve. So in basically what I presented today, like the, the first one, I didn't write the, 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 the cost function. But the cost function over there is, uh, is the worst case. So you're doing minimax. Is that, and, and is that a standard thing to do when you talk about robust MPC? It's, you're always solving a minimax mm. problem. No, so basically what people do is that they do this like certainty equivalent uh, control where basically like you have the nominal model. So the nominal model is with the one without uncertainty and mm -hmm. you have the cost function on that. And that's a proxy of your expectation, but it's important to underline that when you have steady input constraints, it's not your expectation, unless your policy is parameterized to be linear. I see, I see. So I see. Um, so can I understand it like, you know, when you, because I'm thinking in terms of regret, actually, when you're comparing, mm -hmm. you know, your policy against some kind of benchmark, and that's the regret, right? So what kind of regret do you define when you have uncertainties like W's, yeah. when there's not explicit distribution on top? So now it becomes hard to define 
what's your objective function but but what you said makes sense yeah so you define your objective function um with kind of like a nominal trajectory and then um you solve the robust optimization assuming there's disturbances mm -hmm. i see yeah yeah and so actually that's like you know that's already like a question that like i don't know how to answer so if you have like the constrained linear quadratic regulator how do you compute the, the regret with respect to the actually the optimal which is np hard can you uh, it's i don't know i don't know it seems it seems hard yeah i don't think it's tractable i think a Not biggest tractable. assumption in real graph framework is like two first you you, you kind of need to explicitly characterize the offline optimal like you need a yeah. way to characterize what you would do if you have all the perfect information yeah. if you cannot characterize it's very hard second I the, the the offline and online they have to experience the same w so 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 that's it, fine it, 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 yeah but it, it is why it's very hard to analyze what if w is state dependent so for, for example if w is sine xt that that becomes mm -hmm. hard because technically your offline optimal does not need to uh have the same w as the online algorithm experience right because it's a function of a state so i think mm -hmm. it's a too too biggest uh, problem with that what I thought in the regret framework. I, I see, but I think already for the L constrained LQR, it would be, I don't know, it would be interesting. It's a question that I ask to, to a lot of people and they all right. say that it's hard. It's why, it's why I'm, a, I think, I think a, a Manfred Morari's paper, like explicit solutions gonna be critical if we really want to have a, like a, a regret guarantee for, for the constraint framework. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. This is this was my point, but like somehow you need to use that. And the solution to that paper is NP hard, but like at least you know the you know the shape. So let me see if I can pull the slide. So you you, you it's hard to compute, but you know the form. So you, you know that when you optimize over this is gonna be piecewise piecewise linear base, piecewise affine. So um I actually missed this. So uh, what is piecewise affine here? The optimal value function over the different uh, policies? Okay, no, so the optimal value function is piecewise quadratic, mm -hmm. but the optimal policy is piecewise affine. I see. And so the, the, the quick intuition about that is that if you have an LQR problem, the optimal solution is quadratic. Mm -hmm. So when you have constraints, basically depending on different or which constraint is active, you can think of like having different LQR solutions. Mm -hmm. So now you stitch them all together and you get this piecewise quadratic in different regions of the state space. I see. Um, and also I'm not the most familiar with learning LQR and, and Guanya was saying something about um, how it's difficult to know whether you have the optimal model or not. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit about that, Guanya? Right. So I think Ugo already elaborated very, very accurately. Like all, all, all the IOQR learning paper works because we know the optimal controller is U is minus K star X. Mm -hmm. We know that. And we know mm -hmm. K star is solving from Riccati equation. Mm -hmm. But think about LQR with constraint. You cannot even write a, even if, even if I give you perfect A, B, Q, R constraint, mm -hmm. W, whatever, you cannot even give me a you know, close form, like a, of the offline optimal. Right. So regret is some- No, you, you, can, you can, right? One is this one. You, you can, no? but but I mean, it's hard to analyze. It's hard to write, you know, have a close yeah. form, uh, like, uh, but, but I, 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 it's pro in, maybe it's possible. I'm just saying it's mm -hmm. uh, much harder compared yeah. to uh, the, K, the K star case, the K star X case. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I, I I think it's super exciting if uh, if uh, we can have some result in uh, some people can have this yeah. result in this in this direction, yeah. Yeah, and but I, I think like the, yeah, this is this is hard. Uh, but I think that the thing that like the reason why I wanted to kind of like describe this is because it's hard to compute explicitly, but you know the shape, so you right. you actually know how this thing looks like. So you know, for instance, in the I, I didn't show you the the proof for the, I guess for the for the LMPC things, but I was using 
only the fact that I knew the shape. I didn't know to compute. So once you know the shape, you know, there are things that you can do. For instance, you can leverage convexity and other things. Uh, and also, Ugo, I have a question. Also, like for, for in learning uh, IQR, exploration is very important. So usually I saw some papers uh, also add a violation, the number of violations of constraint in their regret. But however, in control, as we know, the, all the constraints are kind of hard. Do you think it makes sense to introduce the number no. of like a constraint no. violation as a part of regret? No. Like, it's a little weird no. to me, to be honest, because, yeah. Yeah, so that's a great question. So and actually, like, we spend a lot of time talking about the requirements and like, I guess I'm going to deviate a little bit and then come back to what you're saying and what you're asking. And so one thing is that, you know, as a control theorist, we really care about stability. Right, so like stability is something that like we care a lot and there are good reasons for caring about it. But it turns out that like when everything is stochastic, you know, it's it's really hard, right? So if you read all these papers, at most you can show that like with probability alpha, this time step, things are good, right? So now if we care about infinite horizon, right? You know, this probability of alpha, you know, is gonna be, probability of failure is gonna be one, right? Because it's independent and they multiply, right? Mm -hmm. And so this was like a major setbacks for a lot of paper I wanted to write because I'm like, I cannot address them to a control community because they're gonna ask me like, what about stability? I'm gonna say like, I, I cannot, right? Mm -hmm. But you know, if I if the only way for me like to die is like on a plane crash, right? I, I wouldn't take, you know, I, it will happen, right? Because there's 10 to the minus nine, but like I take the airplane because like I have a finite span. So like, it's not gonna happen, right? So. Is is so? How do we bring that into the control community? And like, I mean, and of course, this does. It, I think it has to come from someone, you know, that is like a well established and say like, okay, probably stability is something that like these infinite time properties is something that maybe we shouldn't care too much. And you know, like once you kind of tap into that there is also this thing about uh, robustness, right? So is it okay if I fail with probability 10 to the minus 10? I think so. So then does that mean that like we need to change our control design and our metrics? Probably. But I think that when you start to use data, and like I really saw this, that like it's, there is no way that like you, you say like I'm robust for all. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, because of what you described, I mean, in, you know, for the last couple of minutes, just searching through this tree is NP hard in the length of the horizon, because that's the only way you're going to get an exact guarantee that for all disturbances, you're going to have, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to end up with an optimal policy. So what you're saying is, we have some structure in what the cost looks like. And maybe there's a way for us to optimize the search over this tree to leverage that structure that we know but you probably won't get exact guarantees. Oh, um, so I guess, no, this was more related to Guanyin's question, which was like, what if like my model is is uncertain, right? Right, yeah. Then, I, 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 th I think I got that part. I, I was just coming back to this. Uh, what, what was the, um, no. back to this optimizing over this tree? Um, oh, I, I think it was, Maybe maybe unrelated. Maybe Guanya missed something, but I think it was it was maybe more general about like the fact that like this model which are learned are true with some confidence and with some probability. Right. Right. But if you want to reformulate this problem as tractable, again, there are like a ton of strategy in here. Gonna have like a a nice list. I think. One that I particularly, I think this really gives an overview on a lot of things, but again, all these are papers which work in this, um, in this area. And the idea is that when you parameterize your policy, you can get around that tree structure, sacrificing optimality a little bit. Mm. But guaranteeing safety, sacrificing optimality, but guaranteeing safety. Mm 
Any other questions? Thanks a lot for the great lectures. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.